Hello! Hey and welcome uh, to my first ever video where I want to talk about um, my latest site project. I want to explain the different um, steps that I took and the different tools that I used um, to build a Fruit Ninja clone in the browser that you play with your hand movements. So I'm not gonna, this is not gonna be live coding. Uh, it took me quite a while to build, so I don't think you would want to have live coding for this. But I wanna talk about the main steps um, that were involved into building this in case you are interested uh, or it gives you another idea or you want to build something similar. So before I start diving into the tools and the code samples, I thought I would show you a little demo of how it all works um, so that you can understand what we're talking about. So here I have the main home screen of my Splat game where I just remind the user to allow access to the camera because we're gonna do post detection. Uh, to take a step back from the computer and to try to be in a space that is well, that is well lit to optimize um, the detection. So when you start, there's going to be a little sound and I totally lost. So let me just refresh. This is not a good way to start. So I'm loading the model and all the things. Do -do -do -do. Okay, and now we're going to start again. So I'm going to put the sound a little bit down because that was really loud. Um, all right, so let's try again. And I have my hand. All right, so I'm recording my screen at the same time as playing. So this is like super slow. It's not usually that slow. It's just a little bit slow usually. And uh, uh, get the apple. Okay, I didn't get the apple. Um, yeah, this is like really slow. And I'm supposed to avoid the bombs. So I just don't move when there's a bomb. Uh, so right now it looks like it's like horribly slow, but it's not always like that, I swear. It's just a little bit slow. Uh, but now that you have an idea of what the concept of the game is, I want to talk about the steps that I took to break that problem down into pieces. Um, as we can see, we want to be able to detect the motion of our hands. So there's going to be some pose detection, but we're also working in 3D. So we're going to um, find a way to create a 3D scene. Uh, there's also 3D objects because I have fruits of like bananas, apples and a bomb. So we're going to have to add some 3D objects to our scene. The next step is going to be to map the 2D coordinates from my hand movements to 3D coordinates in the in the scene. So that's going to be a little bit more complicated, but I'm going to go quickly over what, um, what how to do that. And finally, the, the other main step is the collision detection. Uh, as I'm moving my head around, I want to be able to detect when I collided with a fruit so that I can get points or game over if I'm hitting a bomb uh, and things like that. Uh, so now that I went from the original idea to breaking the problem down into smaller pieces, let's talk about the tools. So the tools that I want to use for pose detection is the PoseNet model. So it's a machine learning model that you use with TensorFlow.js, so to do machine learning in the browser, that allows you to do pose detection. So it detects different key points of your body, and you can track the coordinates of these points on the screen using the webcam feed. And for the 3D part of that project, where we're adding a scene and objects like the banana and apple and bomb, uh, I want to use the 3GS library, which is this really cool JavaScript library that allows you to do 3D in the browser. If you've never checked it out before, um, please do. You don't have to build something with it if you don't want to, but at least check the examples. They're really cool and quite impressive. So now that I talked about the different tools that I used to do the pose detection and um, creating the 3D scene, let's dive into the code. So as I said, I'm not going to do uh, any live coding that would take too long. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole code. Uh, I don't think it would be that interesting, but I'm going to go through the key parts. So one of the first thing that you need to do is to load the PoseNet model. To be able to detect the body movements, we have to load that model onto our application uh, to be able to run the, the prediction. So to do that, you have to call the load method with a few different parameters. So in terms of architecture, so the, I use MobileNet v1 because it's a smaller model, uh, so it's faster to load, but it's not as accurate. There's also the ResNet 50. Um, I think that you can use that as architecture as well. Uh, it, the, the accuracy is better, but it's slower to, um, to load. So depending on what you want to build, you might use one over the other. So the second step here, we're going to um, call our load video function that is going to give us access to the camera feed so we can use that with PoseNet to detect the body. So our load video is just calling the setup camera function as well. And what this is doing here is it's going to call the uh, get user media native uh, browser function that allows you to get the access to the camera feed. So we're just setting a few parameters of like width and height and we don't care about the, the audio because we just want to look at the images. And once we actually have access to this video feed, we are going to call our detect pose in real time uh, function with passing the video to it. So what this function is going to do, we're going to scroll a little bit down. 
So it's going to do two uh, things. So the first thing that this um, function is going to do is it's going to call the estimate single pose method um, that is going to look for poses. So it's going to look for the key points. It's going to look for a body shape in the camera feed. And then we can loop through the poses that we found in the camera feed. And if it's if the score is over a certain threshold, so if we're quite confident about what we found, we can filter through and look at the key points that we're interested in. So for my case, I wanted maybe the left wrist or the right wrist, but you could find the knee or, you know, the shoulders, uh, depending on what you want to build. We need to use request animation frame because we need to call this function again and again to look at um, every new data coming from the webcam feed. We're not running it once because as we're moving in front of our camera, we want to get, we want to check the position over and over again. And if you do find the key point uh, in the list of poses, then you can have uh, access to the position property that will give you an object of X and Y coordinates. <sighs> so this is basically what you need to do to load PoseNet onto the page, uh, have access to the camera feed and um, look into this feed to see if you find any key points that are part of like body parts that you can use uh, for interaction. So now that we have access to the position of our hand in the camera feed, we need to set up the 3D scene for the game. So when working with 3D, there's a few main elements that you have to um, set up. So there's your scene where things are going to happen. There's going to be your camera looking at the scene. You need a renderer to render things onto the scene. And then you can add uh, things like lights or objects uh, and things like that. So I'm not going to go through all of the things that you can add to a scene, but I'm going to go through the little code samples that I have in my own project. So first of all, I have my init scene function that's going to create a basic scene, a perspective camera. There's a few different types of cameras that you can use, uh, but I don't know that much about why you would use one over the other. So let's just go with perspective camera. <laughs> Um, and then we're setting the position of our camera. Uh, here I'm positioning it on uh, axis, like on point zero zero in X and Y axis and 300 in the Z axis. And I'm adding that camera to the scene. And then to be able to render things onto the scene, I'm moving on to my init renderer function. So here I'm using WebGL renderer and I'm passing it alpha true as a parameter because by default, the background of your um, scene or renderer is going to be black, but I want to be able to see the image that I used as background in CSS. So I'm, pa I'm passing alpha true to have a transparent background in my scene. I'm setting a few pixel ratio and sizes, but the most important thing here is I'm uh, appending the renderer DOM element to my container, so to my uh, div in my HTML. So now we have a scene and we have a renderer, but we didn't add anything to the scene. So in 3GS, you can add some kind of like primitive shapes, like you can create a cube or a sphere. But in my game, I want to have bananas and apples and bombs. So to do this, I actually went to poly.google.com where you can find some 3D assets uh, and I downloaded them and now you have to load them onto your scene. So at first I have my fruits models array of objects where I'm giving the path to the model and its material. And I'm just adding a name property as well, uh, because later on it's going to be easier to find, um, to identify the, the fruit that I need to work with. So here my load fruits models function is where it's going to load our assets in our application to be able to be used and generated in the scene. I'm using the MTL loader to load the material first, and then the OBJ loader to load the actual uh, object. And here I'm using the traverse method to actually go all the way down to finding the mesh of the object, uh, because this is what is going to be used for the uh, collision detection. And then once we've, uh, once I've loaded the object, I want to actually call my generate fruit function that is going to um, actually add the fruit onto the scene because at the moment we just loaded the asset, but we didn't actually add it to the scene. So here we're going to go through my generate fruits uh, function. So I want to generate a random fruit because I want to sometimes have a banana, sometimes an apple, sometimes a bomb, and I don't want to know when it's coming. Uh, so I generate them randomly. And then depending on the object that I get, either an apple, a banana, or a bomb, I'm going to set different um, positions. So this is more of a code sample. I'm not actually setting in the game zero, zero. I'm setting the position randomly, uh, but just to make it easier to, um, to see and to explain right now, I'm just kind of like setting it zero, zero, hundred or whatever. But as you um, load different objects or as you want to position, position them randomly, you would change these values. And once you've actually set the position of these objects, then you can add them onto the scene and you re-render the, the whole thing to be able to see it on the screen. All right, so that was it for uh, setting up a basic 3D scene. There is more code than that uh, that's involved uh, in, in that particular game, but the main parts are these ones. So setting up the scene, uh, the renderer, loading the objects onto the scene and generating them and re-rendering the whole thing. So now we are able to track the position of our hand in 2D and we, are, we have created the scene but we can't stop there. The goal of the game is to be able to move our hand and slice some fruits in 3D. Um, so there's two parts to do that. We have to map 
the 2D coordinates from the pose detection to the 3D coordinates in the 3D world, which is like kind of difficult. And then we have to do the collision detection to know when we're slicing a fruit. So this is a part where I'm not really familiar, so I'm not going to explain entirely how it works, but I'm going to show you how to do it. So the first thing here is we have to create a vector to be able to map the 2D position of our hand from PoseNet to the 3D world. The coordinates are not the same, unfortunately, so we have to find a way to transform our 2D X and Y to uh, X and Y in the 3D world as well. So this is how you do it. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through it. And once you have your 3D vector, you have to do this bit of magic here that I definitely can't explain, uh, but it does things. And then magically, you can copy that new position until the position of your hand mesh and it will match. So what will happen is that if you have your hand over the right side of the screen, you should be able to see a 3D shape on the screen that kind of moves on the same coordinates um, as your hand, which is cool. If you don't understand what this does, don't feel bad because I don't either. And usually what I end up doing is that I copy and paste this bit of code from one of my projects to another and I reuse it. If I wanted to really understand what it does, I would dive into it more, but uh, I don't really have that time for that. And now, finally, now that we have mapped our coordinate from 2D to 3D, we can do the collision detection. You can't do the collision detection without transforming uh, the coordinates first. So this is where we're going into the second part of the project that I can't really explain properly. I know what it does, I don't know how it does it. Collision detection has another name that is called ray casting. And ray casting is basically casting a ray from an origin point, your hand, in a certain direction. And it's going to check whatever intersects that ray. Whatever intersects that ray is going to be something that collides with um, the vector, kind of. And uh, this is how you know that you've collided with something. So we can see here that our origin point for our ray is going to be the position of our hand. So we're getting the position of our hand. So for all the vertices in our hand geometry, we're going to do another bit of magic that I'm not going to go into, um, but we're going to create another ray from that origin point in a certain direction. And we're going to call the intersect objects method on the ray. And we're passing the fruits object. So we're going to check, we're going to only check for the collision with a fruit. So if I had other objects uh, in my scene that were not fruits that were stored in another array than fruits objects, then it wouldn't matter if I intersect with it. And then using this, I store it in a collision results variable. And if there is any collision um, here, I'm checking the distance. So this is another thing where as I don't, as Positioning things in 3D is a bit hard. I used 200, but I had to play around with different values. Uh, but basically, if there's a certain distance, uh, I know that I've collided with a fruit. Um, and then from there, you can add a point or do game over or play a sound or whatever. But this is how you end up with your collision detection. So that's pretty much it in the code samples that I wanted to cover. Uh, but we've covered the main parts of this splat game. Uh, we learned how to load the PoseNet model. Um, we, we learned how to get the camera feed. We learned how to get the X and Y coordinates of the hand. Then we created a 3D scene and we loaded our objects and we generated our objects. And then we did some conversion of 2D coordinates to 3D and we did some collision detection. So if you want to have a look at the whole code sample, I will add the link to GitHub and I wrote a little blog post as well that goes a little bit deeper into this. Um, but my neighbors are making a lot of noise. So uh, yes, hopefully it was helpful. So yeah, it was really fun to build. It was quite tricky at times. Um, as I showed in this video, I don't understand all of the bits that I wrote, but I are you for real? Okay. Uh, hopefully it gives you uh, ideas or or maybe you want to try it out as well. Maybe you want to try only PoseNet but not 3D and it's totally fine as well. Uh, but as you can see, I don't understand entirely all the bits of code, but I managed to make it work together. And as a side project that I do on the weekend, that's enough for me. Anyway, thank you.